back now with our legal panel, including jury consultant Jill Huntley-Taylor, criminal defense attorney Mark O'Mara, and Randy Kaye, who is at the, uh, the courthouse. Randy, I mean, th they, in the closing statement, the prosecutor really hammered the lies. Absolutely, Anderson. Uh, Creighton Waters, that was really the theme, of course, throughout their whole case, that he was a liar. Uh, but during that closing argument, he used the word lie, lying, or liar at least 100 times. And he, that was a message to the jury, that this guy lied to investigators, he lied to us, he lied to prosecutors, he lied to clients, he lied to his family, he lied to his law partners, and he is lying to you. You cannot trust what he's telling you from the stand. That was his message. Um, I, I want to, you know, it's always fascinating, and, and just give you, Joey, we talked about this a lot of times. The, one of the things that obsessed me is how Paul Murdoch saying, you know, to the jury, I promise you, and I would never hurt, you know, his wife and son. He hurt his wife and son for, he, he was taking, he was spending $60,000 a week in some cases, allegedly, on oxycodone and all sorts of drugs, and, I mean, he hurt them in way, numerous ways. Maybe he hadn't shot them earlier, but, I mean, he's been lying to them for their entire lives. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was counting on the jury, drawing a distinction, that he could admit to those lies, he could admit to having lied to them about using drugs, he could admit, uh, admit to lying to his clients and to his partners, but that the jury would see a distinction between all of that. I just think when somebody who's a habitual liar turns to a jury, Jill, let me ask you, you're the jury consultant, if a habitual liar turns to the jury and says, I promise you this, does any, I mean, why would anybody buy that? Well, it's interesting because usually with witnesses, when they admit things that are really bad about themselves or really bad that they did, it, it lends credibility to the rest of their testimony. Yeah. But that apparently is not true when that thing you're admitting is that you're a liar. So if you're a liar, and you've just told the jury something that's really important for them to know. And not only is he telling little lies, he's telling big lies. And the big, big lie is really, I think, what 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 did him, uh, you know, got him the ver guilty verdict he got. Mm. So, so one of the interesting things that I think the prosecution did very well on that cross-examination when they went over the financial stuff with him. So you looked your clients in the eye, is that right? And when you looked them in the eye, you knew you weren't being truthful and you took money. You took money from a quadriplegic, you did that, didn't you? You took money from a teenager, you looked them in the eye too. And they were making the parallel between him looking at his clients and lying seamlessly just as he looked at the jury in an effort to connect and communicate with them and look them in the eye, too. So I think it was a very, very powerful and impactful part of the prosecution's case to make the parallel between the lies he's told all of his life while looking in the eye that's, that's and the lies he was telling to the jury. But he also did this inventory, you know, which is, all right, so did you lie to Bob Jones about the money? Uh, yes, I did. Did you lie to him about this? Well. Not about that, but yes, about this. Okay. Did you lie to John Smith about both things? Mm. Yes, I did. So while this has nothing to do with the murder, they put him through the paces for how long, through how many names, to just to show to the jury how many people he lied to, about how many things, mm. over what period of time to, to implant in the minds of the jury Lying is not of second nature to this individual. It's a it's a it's a go-to. Yeah. Mark Omer, how damaging do you think the evidence about the financial crimes was? And I mean, there's well, we should talk about that. Morgan, take a break after you talk, Mark. But we'll come back to that. But how damaged do you, do you do you think his his financial crimes were to the jury? Well, I think it was impactful because it does give that motive and it does sort of give the who this person really is. It, it was a weak connection between I have financial problems, so therefore I will kill. But after all, that was exactly what the state had to get to. And they had to bridge it that this guy will do anything. He will lie. He will do drugs. He will steal money, everything that he can do. So it makes it a little bit more easy to accept for a jury that, by the way, he will also kill. And I think in that way, they, they bridged it pretty well. Obviously, they did because they got their conviction. But I do think it was compelling. I did have a concern, and Anderson, you and I talked about it, that they may have been focusing on the dollars too much, but they had to because it was a circumstantial evidence on the murder side. Are, are the question now, of course, are there issues for appeal? And we'll talk about that when we come back. And also, when we come back, I want to play you probably one of the most powerful things that the prosecutor said um, in court, with, there showed a little bit of, uh, in Randy's piece, the top of the hour, but the timeline that he constructed, and when you hear 
the prosecutor's timeline of what the defense is saying, actually, or claiming was actually happening, you, you see how it's impossible it is that there was anybody else involved in this, uh, or at least that, that Paul, it was impossible that Alec Murdoch was not there when the killings took place. We'll be right back.